Um, awesome. So let's get going. So the warm question says this, a particle has a kinetic energy, E sub K, and associated de Broglie wavelength, lambda. Come up with a relationship of how the energy is proportional to the wavelength. So to do that, remember we go back with our trusty old relationship to kinetic energy from SL physics, it's one half mass, speed of the object squared. And we also have to recall that the de Broglie wavelength, lambda, equals Planck's constant divided by the momentum. So those are the two key ideas we have to somehow combine here. So momentum equals what? Momentum we know is equal to the mass of an object, the mass of a particle times its velocity. So notice I can write this, rewrite the de Broglie hypothesis as this. The wavelength equals Planck's constant divided by the mass times the velocity, okay? So, I want to know, I want to link lambda wavelength with kinetic energy. So to me, there's a couple ways you could do this, but to me, the most simplest way uh, that I see actually is that you take, you solve this equation for velocity. And to do that, I'm just going to do a couple of algebra steps all at once. I'm going to bring the velocity, the V over to the left. I'm going to bring the lambda over to the right. They're kind of kind of switch spots, so to speak. Okay. Now what I can do now that I have an expression for V is I can take that and I can put it in here. And so let me do that. I get kinetic energy is equal to one half mass times Planck's constant divided by mass times wavelength, all that squared. Okay, and so what happens? Uh, the H, when I, when I take this, when I square everything, Planck's constant squared comes out here. I still have the two underneath. I have an m on top, I have an m squared on the bottom, and I have a lambda squared on the bottom. Right, all I did is to distribute that exponent. So then, um, what do I got going on here? I'm gonna take one of the m's cancel, and I'm just gonna take everything that's a constant and put it out in front. So that's h squared over two m, and what's left is one over lambda squared. So the question asks, what's the relationship of how kinetic energy is proportional to the wavelength? And there, there is the equation with all of this in brackets. I'll put this in brackets just to make it stand out. All of this is constant. So what we can say is that the kinetic energy is proportional to the inverse of the square of the wavelength of an object, of a particle. Okay? So there's your warm-up answer. Okay, let's get into the lesson for today. We have a few announcements really quickly, and then I want to talk about some uncertainty stuff. All right, I already did that, I already did that. Okay, um, due tonight is the electron diffraction video questions. That's via Google Classroom. Also, I will be turning back the photoelectric effect, um, certainly by this weekend, maybe sooner. Um, and then due Monday is the legacy project proposal, which I'm going to talk about here um, in later, later on. Okay, I do also want you to remember that we have two fabulous speakers this week. Um, also, just so you know, we had two amazing speakers last week. Uh, some of you joined in, which was awesome. If you didn't, I do have a recording of Anshu Roy's talk, which I thought was just incredible. And it's about a little over 50 minutes long. He actually talked for maybe 35 or 40 of it, and the rest of it is question and answer. But he was amazing. And the things he's talking about with portable ultrasound just um, made me. Um, feel really optimistic about the future. So I will try and post that link here in the next couple of days. If I forget, please remind me to. A lot going on on my end sometimes. Um, but this week we have on Thursday, today, later today at 1 p.m., Kristen Bott. She basically has a biology background and then she became sort of a, a data scientist guru. Um, so she should be really interesting to hear speak. And then on Friday, this is one that I'm going to try and attend uh, for sure. Uh, her name is Jess Burns. She is a science reporter. For Oregon Public Broadcasting and another organization that has a sort of a partnership with Oregon Public Broadcasting called EarthFix. So I strongly encourage you to um, to basically go to those talks. If you're ever wondering how you get there, it's really quickly. It's bit.ly slash ibsci speak. That's the document. And in the in the in that document, there's a link to the Google Meet session. Okay. Awesome. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is, I want to get into the slides. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. 
we're going to talk about legacy projects, and you're going to have a good chunk of time in breakout rooms to talk about both of these things, explore both these things. So let's get right into it. Um, at this point, I just want to emphasize, this is mainly for people who might watch this video later. If you haven't watched the three blue, one brown video that I flagged yesterday uh, or the day before, uh, it's a really good idea to watch it um, before you keep going with the slides or afterwards. Um, either way works. In some cases, and frankly, I've gotten a lot out of watching that video a couple times. So it's pretty deep, pretty heavy at moments. So you, it's hard to kind of grasp it all at once. And I do just want to start by saying like the topic where we're about to talk about it's highly counterintuitive, meaning it's just really hard to wrap your head around uh, what we mean by uncertainty. Um, these are concepts that are um, just difficult to grasp. So if you find yourself scratching your head and saying, what, I don't get it, um, you're in good company. So don't feel too bad and just keep at it. Okay, so I wanna talk about, I wanna start talking about this idea by just kind of putting out this uh, vision, which uh, or this this scenario. Let's say we have an electron somewhere in space, and we want to know the position and the velocity of that electron. And let's say we're mainly interested in, in knowing exactly, precisely where that electron is. Okay. So in order to do that, we have to somehow interact with it, right? The only way we can observe things about objects is by somehow bouncing things off of them, somehow interacting with them. And when we do that, we call that an observation. So when we were observing the electron, we're somehow having to interact with it because we have to get some information back from it. So the probably the least intrusive way we could interact with that electron is to send out a photon and have it bounce off of it. And based on uh, the time from which we send the photon out to this time we receive that some sort of photon back from that electron, that's gonna give us a sense of its position, okay? And obviously, if we want to be even more certain, we could send two photons out. And if we send the two photons really close together, then we can get pretty accurate and pretty certain about where that electron is, where that electron's position is. And notice as we get a high degree of certainty, we get um, a low degree of uncertainty about its position. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. All right, let's move on to the next slide to kind of understand what also happens when we do this though. So when we observe, remember, um, we're, we're kind of have creating a collision of sorts with the electron. So let's talk about this from a momentum perspective. Um, if the electron is stationary when we're starting, then we know that the momentum of the electron, like all objects, is mass times its velocity. But if it's stationary, it has no velocity. Therefore, the initial momentum of the electron is zero. And if I think of the momentum and the incoming of the electron and the incoming photon that I'm sending at it as a system, then um, we can basically look at it this way. Do you see that? See that graphic? Let me do it one more time, just in case you didn't. All right, there's a collision of sorts there, right? So we can analyze this, but from a momentum or a conservation of momentum perspective. And when we do that, remember we're doing the system momentum before the collision equals the system momentum after the collision. So before the collision, what do we have? We have the electron that's stationary, so it's got no momentum. We've got the momentum of the photon coming in there. Okay, and then and then by the way, I have the, the P with the gamma symbol, that's the momentum of the photon. And all of those values, the actual P numbers are positive. So I'm assigning direction based on the fact that left is negative. So the photon, as you noticed, was traveling to the left. So it's got negative momentum before it hits the electron. And then after it struck the electron, it was moving to the right. So then afterwards, when you see the momentum of the system final, the momentum of that photon is listed right here as a positive number, okay? So what if I solve for momentum of the electron in this equation? Well, notice what I get is I get the momentum of the electron has significantly changed. You can see from the solving of this equation that moment, the electron has gained some momentum. So this should be kind of an aha moment. Hopefully it is. Uh, let me kind of point it out to you if, if you're still kind of um, not sure. Um, what we've noticed here is the very act of trying to figure out an electron's position, our efforts to do that have um, unintentionally, but very concretely, cause the momentum of the electron to change significantly, okay? When I try and figure out position, the momentum changes. That is really key because 
If I say I were to send the two photons towards the electron, because I want to be more certain about the position of the electron, then what's going to happen to the momentum of the electron if I get two uh, photons impinging on it? Okay. Um, notice I basically get a higher degree of certainty in its position, but then the momentum of the electron has changed even more. Okay. So do you see what's going on here? Um, the momentum of the electron, the more I try and figure out the position of the electron, the momentum basically gets uh, even more uncertain, so to speak. There's a greater change, okay? Um, let me pause there to have you absorb that. Um, Elaine asked a question, if left is negative, why is the electron's momentum positive? Um, the electron's momentum afterwards is negative. Notice because momentum of the photon, the, the P value is a positive value, the P with the gamma symbol. So the electron's momentum after the collision is negative. It should be negative because it's moving to the left in our drawing, and we said left was negative. I hope that um, helps explain that question. Okay, so let's go back to the video. And if you haven't watched the video yet, again, I recommend you watch it, but I'll do my best to just kind of summarize it. Uh, in the video, um, at one point, um, they're talking about Fourier transforms, and they're talking about what happens to the, uh, basically the wave function of the position of the electron versus the wave function that describes the momentum. So notice what we've got going on here is the following, and I'm going to try and use, let's see, I think this color will work well. So the video talks about Fourier transforms, and I'm not going to review what Fourier transforms are. And again, what you really need to understand to kind of get a sense for this isn't every in and out about a Fourier transform, but know that the top wave function is expressing uh, the position of the particle, the bottom wave function is expressing the momentum. What we learned in the video is how unsharp each of these are is directly correlated with how much uncertainty there is. So in other words, um, if I draw a position wave function that looks like this, okay, that new wave function that I've just drawn shows less uncertainty in the position of the particle than the previous one that was already there. Okay, and so that's what we've done. When we send those two photons towards that electron, we basically uh, scrunch up, make sharper the Fourier for the position wave function. But what does the video tell us is inherently happening when this occurs to the momentum wave function? More accurately, you know the position, um, the less uncertain, or excuse me, the greater the uncertainty in the momentum of the particle. So in other words, that bottom Fourier transform spreads out, okay? And since it spreads out, it becomes less sharp, we get greater uncertainty in the momentum of the particle. Okay, now, a couple important things to note about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And let's first just talk about it in equation form. So, German physicist named Werner Heisenberg in 1927, he basically stated this principle and he said, uh, it's impossible to know simultaneously an object's exact position and momentum. And there's two equation forms, and they look like this. Uh, let's make sure we understand what this means. So when I say delta x, this is uncertainty in position. Delta p would be uncertainty in the momentum. That's what we've been talking about. And notice they have to be greater than or equal to, the, the, the product of those two has to be greater than or equal to Planck's constant divided by four times pi. There is another form of this equation. We're not gonna spend as much time with it, um, but it's basically another formulation of it, which says the, the uncertainty in the energy of the particle times the, and the uncertainty in the time of the particle um, is greater than or equal to h over 4 pi. I'm going to spend more time talking about the momentum form because I think that's a little easier to understand and, um, and practice problems are a little bit easier too, okay? So um, this is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle expressed in equation form. By the way, this guy, Werner Heisenberg, I recently finished reading this book called The Bastard Brigade. Uh, great book. It's one of the books you could read for your legacy project if you choose to go that route. He's a really interesting character. He uh, has a very interesting and complex role leading up to World War II and during World War II. He actually does join 
the Germans' efforts to build an atomic bomb. Uh, and it's just a fascinating and sort of intricate portrayal of, of what he does during that time. So it's a really good book for a lot of reasons, and this is one of them. Okay, so um, important notes about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, okay? Um, again, that triangle stands for uncertainty in, and I want to be clear about this. This is not related to imperfect equipment or less than perfect experimental techniques. This is a fundamental, basically, law of nature or idea of nature that, that we can't get around. If I had perfect equipment and perfect technique, I would basically get this equation here, that the uncertainty in the position of the particle times the uncertainty of the momentum would be exactly equal to h over four pi. I could never get lower than that. Crazy. And obviously the same would be true for the other form, the energy divided by energy times time, or the uncertainty in energy times the uncertainty in time. Um, and so basically, again, just, Kind of emphasizing that there's a trade-off here. If I want to know position very uh, exactly, I'm going to have to accept a large amount of uncertainty and momentum and vice versa. Okay, that's the key idea here. Fundamental aspect of nature. Nothing we can do about it. Okay, so uh, let's put this into practice within a sample problem. Now, I'm going to read this, and then I'll walk through it with you. Again, if you have a calculator, strongly recommend you do the calculations as well. Um, and hopefully, this problem will illustrate why we don't really observe the uncertainty principle having an impact on our everyday life. But at a quantum level, at a really at the smallest of things, it has a big impact. So let's talk through it. An electron and a 1,000.0 kilogram jet fighter are observed to have equal speeds of 500.0 meters per second accurate to within plus or minus 0.020%. What is the minimum uncertainty in the position of each? So in other words, you can think of an experiment here where we're doing, uh, and we have super awesome equipment, and we are able to figure out uh, the speeds of the electron and the, and the jet fighter to a pretty incredible precision. So let's figure out what happens to the uncertainty in each of these cases. So remember, the overall equation in this case, is that the uncertainty in the momentum times the uncertainty in the position has to be greater than or equal to Planck's constant divided by four pi. And if, um, if we're talking about the minimum uncertainty, then we can actually write it this way, the uncertainty in the momentum times the minimum uncertainty in the position is gonna equal H over four. I can make that into an, e an equality if I say minimum uncertainty. Okay, well, um, let's see, momentum, we know momentum is mass times velocity, so uncertainty momentum is going to be mass times the uncertainty in the velocity. So I can write that here, mass times uncertainty in velocity, I can substitute that in up above. So notice what I'm doing here, I'm just substituting in, let me just make it super clear, this is going in here. Okay, now let's, also, let's solve this equation for the uncertainty in the position. To do that, I would divide both sides by m delta v, m delta v, and I get the result that the, un, the minimum uncertainty in the position is going to equal Planck's constant divided by 4 pi times the mass of the particle or object times the uncertainty in the velocity. Awesome. Okay, let's apply this equation to the jet fighter first. So the jet fighter, we have to figure out, uh, let's see, we know how to do this. The uncertainty in the velocity is going to be what? The actual velocity value times the fractional uncertainty. So this is a percent uncertainty, so I just have to write, so this is 500.0 meters per second. And this should be times the fractional uncertainty, which means I have to divide by 100. So this is going to be 0 0.00020. Okay, and we get the uncertainty in the velocity of the jet fighter is whatever that is. Let's just use the calculator just to make sure. 500 times 0 0.0002. I get 0 0.0002. 
0.1 meters per second. Okay, awesome. So for the jet fighter then, that minimum uncertainty in position is gonna be, uh, I'm gonna substitute in here, Planck's constant 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds divided by four times pi times the mass, 1,000.0 kilograms. And then the final thing is the uncertainty in the velocity, 0 0.1 meters per second. Take a moment to calculate that in your calculator. So when I do it in my calculator, I get something around 5.28 times 10 to the negative 37th meters. Or I'm just gonna round here, six times 10 to the negative 37th meters. So let's take a second to get an order of magnitude understanding that. Like the, the diameter of a nucleus is around 10 to the negative 15th meters. Okay, so this is incredibly small. Right, the uncertainty in the position of that jet fighter is just incredibly small. Nothing we could even come close to measuring with any of our modern day equipment. And really for our purposes, um, the uncertainty is trivial, right? If I know where a jet fighter is to the 10 to negative 37 meters point, then that's just, whoops, hold on. Then that's pretty darn awesome. Stop doing it. All right, here we go, there we go, all right. Now, let's do the same thing for an electron. Now, if you look at it, the electron's uncertainty in the velocity is gonna be the same, right? It's the same numbers, 500 meters per second, and it's got the same percent uncertainty. So I can just go straight to this equation, and the only thing that's gonna change is that the mass of the electron is obviously quite different than the mass of the jet fighter. Nine, look, in your, look it up in your data booklet. 9.11 times 10 to 31 kilograms times 0 0.1 meters per second. Okay, let's take a moment to calculate that. Okay, yes. Thank you, Charles. I just, I screwed up the rounding on the one above, but frankly, I'm just going to leave it. It doesn't matter for the overall point that I'm trying to make, but you are right. I should have rounded down to five. Good catch. Actually, let's fix it. Okay, yeah, I can't, I can't live with that. Let's go eraser. Okay. All right. So what do we get here? We get that the minimum uncertainty for the position of the electron, when I calculate it out, I get something that is... 5.8 times 10 to the negative fourth meters, or I'll round correctly this time, six times 10 to the negative fourth meters, which is 0 0.6 millimeters. Okay, let's put this into perspective. Um, so if you think about this, Remember, an electron, like the distance from an electron to a nucleus, say, in a hydrogen atom, is roughly about 10 to the negative 10 meters, okay? So this uncertainty for an electron is huge. It's gargantuan, okay? This has a huge impact. If you are doing sort of experiments with electrons and trying to figure out their position and their speed, this is a, uh, a gargantuan sized uncertainty, and it has a very big tangible impact in trying to understand what's going on at, um, with things that are really small, okay, at the quantum level, so to speak. So notice what's going on here. Quantum physics is showing us that at the very small level, some things that we don't notice or that are trivial at our everyday sort of big level become quite, quite important and quite significant. Okay, that is just incredible. Okay, um, so 
Uh, you didn't see the jet fighter going by. It didn't work too well. Oh, well. Okay. So here's what I want to do here with this slide. I just want to give you an overall sense of about 30 years of physics history that really revolutionized physics. And they call it the quantum revolution. And we haven't talked about all these, but we've talked about most of them. And I just want to really quickly kind of give you an overview or review kind of uh, what happens here in a matter of 30 years. 1900, Planck comes up with his uh, Planck's equation that the energy is quantized. Five years later, Einstein publishes the paper where he talks about the photoelectric effect and talks about using Planck's ideas to explain what's going on in the photoelectric effect. And then less than a decade after that, Niels Bohr comes up with this hydrogen model that basically says that electrons can only exist in discrete energy levels and you'll never catch them in between those energy levels. They, in a sense, I like to think of it as they, in a sense, teleport from one energy level to the next. Um, and then about a decade later, Louis de Broglie says, you know what? Even though we've talked about uh, things we think of waves as showing particle properties, well, I think particles also show wave-like properties. And he publishes that. And around that time, Davis and Germer have an experiment that provide evidence for that. And then just a couple years after that, Erwin Schrodinger, we're not going to talk about this, but he comes up with a wave equation, which basically is a way of describing things we think of as particles, but in sort of wave-like um, mathematics. And then you can see here now, a year after that, Werner Heisenberg comes up with this uncertainty principle that we're just talking about. And then just a year after that, remember Paul Dirac, remember we talked about this in the particle physics sort of um, unit. He comes up with equations that suggest that uh, there is such a thing as antimatter. Just astounding what happens in those 30 years. Okay. And you've studied a good bit of it, actually. So that's really cool. Okay. Who's ready for a joke? All right. Hold on. Hold on. I got to get, I got to get something queued up here. My apologies. Give me a second here. It'll be worth it though. Okay, um, not yet. Okay, who's ready? Here we go. What do you call someone who can't smell and doesn't have a torso? Nobody knows. All right, you gotta admit that's a good one. Okay. Um, so that's it as far as physics for today, as far as like new concepts. I want to take a second, a few minutes to talk about the Legacy Project, and then you're going to go into your breakout rooms. So Legacy Project, if you haven't had time to read up on the overview, please go ahead and do that. I'm not going to cover all the ins and outs of the overview. I'm not going to talk about all the options that you have available to you, but a couple of key points I want to make about it. One is I really want you to choose something you find interesting, fun, and motivating. Okay. You have a lot, I'm giving you a large sort of latitude to um, come up with something. And if one of the options that I've listed doesn't really work for you and you have another idea, please write it in your proposal. And I think there's a pretty good chance that I'll be able to work with you and, and um, come up with something that, uh, that would work for you. Um, you can do this legacy project individually or in small groups. The groups can be anywhere up to four individuals. So groups can be two to four people if you wanna do it with someone else. You do have many choices. I'm not giving you, I'm not telling you in this slide all the choices, but I just want to highlight a few. One that I think is really awesome, especially given the sort of pandemic times we're living in, is to pick a physics book that you and a few other students want to read together. Okay. And by the way, you can, even though you might not have a hard time getting a paper copy of a book because libraries aren't open, uh, the library, the public library has ebooks that you can check out. They also have audio books that you can check out through this app. And I put a link to all this stuff in the overview document. And so what you would do is you would pick a book and then you would form a book club that would meet weekly for anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour to discuss the book. So you all would agree, hey, let's read the first two chapters by next Thursday. Thursday, Let's get together at this time on Thursday and we'll talk, okay? That would be an awesome way to do a legacy project. Another thing that students have liked in the past is to create a board or card game that has a physics theme to it, okay? Um, and you would obviously do that that would be harder to do in a group, but who knows? Maybe you could figure it out. Maybe one, maybe everyone brainstorms together on the card game and then certain people do different parts of it. Um, that's something you could do. Um, the physics of movies. Uh, I've seen students pick movie clips and analyze how realistic 
uh, the physics is in those movies, and there's more details in the legacy project. And that would be something you could do because then you could create a multimedia presentation uh, where you are going through some slides and talking about it. Um, also, one thing that I didn't put on the legacy overview, but is something that you could do is you could also create a podcast that discusses physics topics between you and a couple of students in an engaging, fun way. Okay, so those are some of the choices. Those aren't all of them. Um, what I do want to make sure you understand is the timeline. So your first timeline, which is a written proposal uh, submitted via Google Classroom, is due this coming Monday. By Monday night, I want to get a sense of what, what you're thinking. And again, you're going to see on the proposal document, you just have to answer like four or five questions, and you need to have a backup plan too. And then on a weekly basis, pretty much, I'm looking for some a progress update from you. And then the goal would be by the end of May, the final project is complete and submitted. And if you have to do some sort of presentation, either live or recorded, that you would have that done or submitted. So really, I'm looking to finish, wrap it up by that Wednesday, Thursday, May 27th, 28th. OK. Um, are there any questions for me about what I've covered today or, um, or the legacy project that I can answer for the big group? Because the next thing we're going to talk about here is breakout sessions. So in fact, I'm going to start talking about breakout sessions. If you have a question about legacy project, put it in the chat, and I'll make sure I look at the chat before I send you your breakout rooms. OK, breakout rooms. You're going to be put into a breakout room here in a few minutes. And you have basically two tasks. I want you to discuss, brainstorm, final project ideas for about the first five minutes. OK? Maybe some of you want to think about joining up with a group, or maybe some of you just want to bounce your idea off other people, even though you'll be doing it individually. And then the second part, which is the bigger part, is I want you to go to the blog, and there are some in-class quantum physics problems that I want you to work on as a group. And that's going to be anywhere from 15 to 25 minutes you're going to spend doing on that. And the other thing I have for you today, and I really want you to try and use it and give me some feedback, is I have put in each breakout room what's called a Google Jamboard. Think of it as a whiteboard that everyone has access to. So the idea would be um, you have one person present the Jamboard. Okay, Everyone has, a, has the ability to write on it. And you basically write on it to try and work out the problems. And you can get help from classmates. Um, but I think it'd probably be best for one person to have like be writing on the Jamboard at a time. Because if everyone starts writing, that can get a little bit uh, chaotic. But take turns using it. And I would love to get your feedback about what are good ways or novel ways we could maybe use the Jamboard in the future. OK. Um, when, I, when I send you your breakout room, I tried to make it. And I made these yesterday. And I obviously didn't know exactly who was going to um, be here. So certainly not everyone in the room is going to be here. So hopefully your room has at least two people and no more than five. If there are more than five people in your room, let me know. And I can split you up into two groups. Because when it gets to be more than five, it gets to be a bit chaotic. Know that I am going to be visiting each room every few minutes, OK? I have tabs open, and I basically go from tab to tab. And I unmute myself, and we can have a conversation if you need to. If you have a question for me, and I, and I haven't visited your breakout room yet, put in the chat box, Mr. Bob, we have a question so that I know when I get to your chat, to your room, and I at least see the chat, that I unmute myself and give you a chance to ask your question, OK? Sometimes I have glitches on my computer, and I can't unmute myself properly. And then I'll just talk to you via the chat box, if that's the case. OK, um, so let me just see if there are any other questions for the whole group to consider before we go to the breakout rooms. It looks like there is not. OK, so I'm about to put in the um, chat box here the breakout room um, assignments. So what you want to do here when I post this is you want to go open up the document, uh, click on the link that corresponds to your breakout room. Um, and obviously, wait there a few minutes, because it might take people a few minutes to get on. Uh, I would expect you to hang up from this call. Uh, I will stick around here for a few minutes, just in case you have trouble getting into a breakout room for some reason. And then, uh, and then just go from there. And when you're done in the breakout room, you're done for today. OK? All right. Let us begin. There is the breakout room assignments in the chat box. There's a link there. Click on that link, um, depart this call, and go to your breakout rooms. Thanks, everyone.